Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this special session on uh, Gray's elegy, especially uh, elegy written in a country churchyard, which uh, I'll be discussing in approximately three classes. Now, uh, I just like to uh, plan out the elegy because it's a pretty long poem. So what I'll be doing in these three classes is in the first class, I'll talk about the rise of the literature of sensibility with the definition of the forms in which Gray is working, especially the elegy within the graveyard school of poetry. And I'll be talking about what this school of sensibility is or what this idea of sensibility is and what were uh, the dominant features within which elegy, uh, the elegy was being written. Now, uh, for this, I would like to put forward a screen share which uh, highlights many of the points that I want to make. So here goes. Uh, now, the period of sensibility, I'm going to argue, is an in-between period of flux between uh, neoclassicism and romanticism. But it is operational also as an intermittent period between the high school of reason and the school of subjective feeling. Now, you will, of course, note that Augustan poetry was marked by the presence of a formal structure within poetry, a return to the classics, as it were, especially the formal structures of the ode, the elegy, the pastoral, and so on and so forth. If you remember the operative classical poet was Horace with his dictum of, uh, <clears throat> you know, keeping a poem for nine years before publishing. And also where he considered technique or the technique of the poem is fundamentally important, the dominant form of Horace being satire. But if you remember Virgil also writing eclogues and pastorals, which were used by the 18th century poets. So this is the age of high formal poetry, formal structure, language, and meter. But it was also dominated by the discourse of rationality, especially from the empirical philosophy of Locke. So uh, reason, public issues being the subject of literature, formal structures in poetry, language, and meter. Now, Within this formal structure and within the discourse of reason, of course, we have alternative voices like the Earl of Shaftesbury, for example, arguing about this discourse of benevolence or feeling as another way to truth and sociability. But I think in the middle of the century, this discourse comes to a very powerful uh, sort of uh, articulation in the philosophy of David Hume where Hume argues, you see, that reason is not the only way to truth, but, you know, physical feeling, sentiment and sensibility for others also is another way towards truth. Now, this is also deepened in the 1770s in the work of Adam Smith, who will argue that, you know, feelings rather than reason is a more profound way to virtue. So we have three phases of this uh, discourse of sentiment. The first coming from the late 17th century through the Earl of Shaftesbury, who argues about benevolence and its importance in society. This also gives rise to a literature of sentiment, as you've seen in uh, Steele, for example, sentimental drama against which, once again, uh, Oliver Goldsmith was writing in the middle of the century. The second is a more profound political 
and philosophical shift in David Hume's uh, idea that, you know, sensibility or the exciting of feelings within the human body is also another way of truth, of accessing truth, social truth. And also very importantly, Hume argues that sensibility also leads to sociability. That is to say that sensibility also leads to the you know, bond between the human and the human. So if Locke was talking about rationality as a social phenomenon, then Hume is talking about sensibility as a social phenomenon. And this deepens in the late century when uh, <clears throat> Adam Smith is arguing that sentiments and moral sentiments lead to the projection of or inculcation of a morality and virtue within the human mind. And therefore, sentiments should be prioritized. Right. So this is the discourse of sensibility that uh, <clears throat> the century is cultivating. And this is given a certain kind of a language. You know, if in sentimental drama, the language is primarily one of uh, tears, uh, you know, very delicate feelings bursting into reflections. Then by the middle of the century, this discourse is more geared towards a kind of a melancholia, a kind of a loss, anxieties. Whereas in Stern and the others later on, of course, it will be a more delicious uh, kind of moral reflection once again. But the period which I am referring to, and Gray's poetry is falling within this period, is talking about, you know, the inevitability of death, sense of loss, as I've said, fragmentation of life, decay of a way of living, death, and so on and so forth. Now, these, has, these have its own social reasons as well. One of the major, major reasons being the way of passing of one kind of society into other, especially the movement from the country to the city. Now, all of you are aware that this is the age when the colonial endeavor takes on a great shape. Rudimentary, uh, I'll not call it industrialization, but trade and commerce get a great fillip. And therefore, there are movements from the urban, I'm sorry, from the villages, from the rural hinterlands, in great numbers to the city. And so much so that, you know, entire villages are left deserted of young men. So there is this, you know, feeling or overwhelming sensation that a way of life is making way to another kind of existence. So if there is a societal kind of a shift, then the anxieties, losses, sense of fragmentation, decay of the village finds its expression into poetry as well. Right. And this is the mid-century poetry that Gray is talking about. So the death of, uh, of which, you know, these poems talk about is not really about only personal sense of losses, but it is also about the loss of an entire way of existence uh, within which I will place the elegy written in a country churchyard. Now, I've already talked about the sensibility and the language of feeling. And this is also seen, you know, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, what we call sensibility, language of feeling, is also seen as organizing a shift in the subject of poetry. So no longer is the, you know, aristocrat or the man of studying or the man of uh, knowledge, the subject of poetry, but also the common individual becomes the subject matter of poetic discourse. Now, remember that with the novel, the common man had already become a subject of discourse in prose. But in this particular case, you know, the common man and especially the marginalized common poor man 
poverty becomes one of the major themes of this entire you know, discourse. If you look at Henry Mackenzie's The Man of Feeling, for example, written for 1745, you will find that you know, the hero is somebody who is marginalized in society, belonging to the underclasses, belonging to uh, a group of effeminate, as it were, very sensitive individuals who uh, <clears throat> will burst into tears at the single most opportunity, who is always impoverished. Therefore, this common man, the rural, sensitive, marginalized common man, now becomes the subject matter of poetry, not prose, poetry. We will po later on find that this is radiated into romantic poetry as well, especially in Wordsworth's poem, The Leech Gatherer. Right. Now, the other kind of, you know, emblematic figures who dominate or populate this kind of poetry is the, or rather are the symbols of the village. For example, the pastor, and very importantly, I'll give you lines from that text, village schoolmaster, right? In fact, uh, Goldsmith's The Deserted Village is one of the monuments of this sentimental poetry. So the village schoolmaster who embodies a certain way of existence, uh, the rural way of existence becomes the subject matter of these poems. Now, if you look at it ideologically, we've looked at it socially, we've looked at it in terms of formality, formalism and te technique, take, let's take a look at it ideologically. Why does this come across and what does it signify? Now, if you notice that this is the point when, you know, modernity is entering into uh, what I'll call public discourse in a very big way. And this modernity is sort of marked, as you will find in my earlier discussions, this modernity is marked by a commercialization, a sense of individualism, a sense of possessive individualism with rudimentary, you know, with a certain amount of, you know, prioritization of self-interest rather than communal feeling. And a very powerful discourse of commercialization and the submission of the human individual self to this discourse of commercialization and as it were a redefinition of the subjective self as an economic self. So from the subjective self as a engrossed within the communal life, you now have a subjective self, which is atomized, which is engrossed within the economic life and marked by a pervasive individualism. Now, this we notice in the novel as well. You know, the kind of uh, gathering of wealth and resources and experience. So, it's the individual who's thrust out rather than the subjective communal, uh, rather than the public communal life to which he belonged. So, the literature of sensibility in arguing that feeling is the basis of sociability and fellow feeling. So, transference of the griefs, grief of others, the joy of others, predominantly sadness, of course, is a way of identification and uh, socialization. This literature of sentiment and sensibility tries to resist ideologically a new discourse of individualism and commercial modernity. So this is where you see the ideological moorings of the discourse of the literature of sensibility sort of uh, lies. And notice that, you know, in their own ways, this discourse of sensibility is resisting the 
rampant urbanization which is related with the commercial modernity and trying to come back or to foreground the rural urban communal way of life that existed in the pre-modern world. But in trying to return to this kind of, uh, as it were, pre-modern, pastoral, rural way of life, very often this poetry is neither radical nor very revolutionary in that sense of the term. So it is a resisting, it's a poetry of resistance also to commercial modernity. But the ideological moorings are not radical or revolutionary. So uh, it's marked by a sense of, I will say, a loss, inevitability of acceptance and a very soft resistance towards a discourse of commercial modernity. It lacks the, the kind of radicalism, revolutionary zeal of the romantics. And Yet it tries to move out of the straight jacketed discourses of rationalism of, and formalism of the earlier century. Now, you will probably have noticed that I'm carefully avoiding the term pre romantic, which many academicians tend to use. Now, when we talk about pre romantic, we are defining this age only in terms of romanticism. No, this term is inadequate because many of the features of this poetry, their formal structures, their going back to the classical molds like the ode, the, roman uh, the, the kind of elegy, for example, that we'll be studying, is a throwback to the Augustan rather than the romantic. So you might argue that in their content, they anticipate some of the romantic concerns, but in their form, they are moored or they are sort of latched onto the age of the Augustans. So to define them as pre-romantic would be losing sight of one of the more important aspects of this poetry. So I would urge you to talk about this, these poems in terms of a literature of sensibility rather than in terms of pre-romanticism, right? They do sort of adumbrate many of the ideas of romanticism, but in the form and technique, they go back to their Augustan lineages. So it's a liminal poetry, a poetry marked by sentiment, sensibility, marked by a sense of loss, fragmentation, decay and death, and a transfer of interest to the common man. And ideologically, they seek to resist, even though they realize it is inevitable, the discourse of commercial modernity. Now, let me take a look at some of the texts which these writers use. And you will note that many of them include, uh, uh, the major ones include Oliver Goldsmith, we have Thomas Gray, we have Young, we have Collins, for example, we have uh, <coughs> Robert Blair, finally leading up to uh, William Blake also. Right. Now, let me take one poem, for example, and this poem is the village, uh, the, the deserted village. This is by Goldsmith. So here are the lines amidst thy desert walks. So the village is now like a desert because the inmates have all left, the younger inmates. The lapwing flies and tires their echoes with unvaried cries. So unvaried that's that's you know almost an eternal unchanging way of life of the village as compared with the modern very very uh, what you can call quickly transforming churning way of life in the city 
sunk are thy bowers in shapeless ruin all. See, when I talked about the fragmentation, decay, ruin, you know, Goldsmith is talking about this way of life as marked by ruin. And the long grass overtops the moldering wall. So a sense of oldness, a sense of decay is, is lingering in these poems. And trembling, shrinking from the spoiler's hand, far, far away thy children. You see, the children are the younger uh, breed of people who are all leaving this village for the city. Ill fares the land to hastening ills a prey, where wealth accumulates and then decay. Right, so Goldsmith is, of course, in a melancholy mood for, you know, the decay of this way, standard of living, this way of living, but you know how he quickly identifies this decay with the wealth of the city, right? So, you know, that this decay is created by this newfound commercial way of life Goldsmith has identified. Teach erring man to spurn the rage of gain. So once again, ideologically, this poem is moored in the resistance against the culture of uh, commercial modernity. Teach him the states of native strength possessed. The very poor may still be blessed. That trade's power, proud empire, hastes to swift decay. So he's comparing the trade's proud empire of the city, which is transient, with the eternal quality of an unchanging quality of the village life. As ocean sweeps the labored mole away, while self-dependent power can time defy as rocks resist the billows and the sky. That was Goldsmith, the deserted village. Now let me come to these words which I've used. Sentiment and sensibility. And, you know, this concept of a literature of sentiment comes into parlance into critical parlance, rather, in 1749. Prior to that, it, of course, existed, but it's not de defined in that sense of the term. And you see in uh, the letter from Reddy Bradshaw to Samuel Richardson, she asks, what is the meaning of the word sentimental? Because you have the sentimental man, sentimental party, sentimental walk, sentimental literature. Right. So 1740s is the time when this discourse comes into being. And you can see that, you know, the, the philosophical roots are from the Earl of Shepsbury's benevolism uh, to David Hume and to Adam Smith. I've, of course, talked about this. And Van Sant, who's been one of the most important theorists, talks about the general shift of the foundation of moral life from reason and judgment to the affectations, to the you know, circulation of feelings, as it were. Now, how does one distinguish between sensibility and sentiment? Now, sensibility has been associated with the body, right? So the capacity to sort of generate feelings for others. And very often the sensibility is marked also by certain physical attributes like tears, like crying out in joy and amazement. So physical stirring of the emotions is what sensibility is. And because tears very often provoke others to tears, you've seen that if somebody cries, you cry with him, right? Therefore, sensibility is seen as sociable. That means it creates a bond between man and man. Locke says that it is created because of reason. Hume says, no, my reason and your reason might be different. But if I feel grief, then you too are liable to feel grief. So it is sensibility which is the sociable bond. Whereas, you see, sentiment is associated with the idea of, you know, grief, death, etc. So sentiment is related with the mind. So the first, that is sensibility, physical sensitivity, and the process of sensation. The second is a refinement of thought. So when there is suffering, 
how does one think and how does one share this thought that is what sentiment is all about and then comes the idea of adam smith who says that sentiment leads to the idea of the conscience and virtue so sentiment is naturally moral he says if you have to inculcate virtue inculcate sentiment right so feelings for others our sensitiveness to opinions of us and our conduct and our conduct and our acceptance of their way of scrutinizing the propriety of our actions now the idea was of course circulated by hume hume once wrote that you know we are just not because we obey a moral law but because we are moved by the passions of sympathy and benevolence so the word that shaftesbury used you know sympathy benevolence and how it generates a kind of fellow feeling is what the literature of sensibility is all about so morality is more properly felt than judged of so morality does not come from reason it comes from feel so feeling it's manifold sort of dimensions and how one represents this feeling what is the language through which this feeling can be sort of communicated becomes the subject of the literature of sensibility so uh, innate moral sense not a prevailing tendency to benevolence unhinderable so this is you unhinderable fellow flow of feeling and on the sympathy that makes it possible so let me quickly now move on to the four tenets of this literature of sensibility i've spent considerable time on it because you know gray is going to talk about this the ideas and the feelings so the four tenets are identification of virtue with acts of benevolence good affections are natural so we will naturally feel for others praise of sensibility instead of stoicism in the face of suffering and the emphasis of self improving joy that is the joy of acting benevolently now by the by this entire stoicism in the face of suffering in the face of suffering is something that gray will of course bring in so gray's text is one part of the literature of sensibility now sentimentalism and sensibility once again has a feeling of or or a or an aura of powerlessness you see the literature of sensibility realizes that the discourse of commercial modernity is very powerful and individualism is an unstoppable force so you know it realizes that it cannot completely overturn it but nevertheless there's this sense of loss and anxiety so there's a also a latent sense of powerlessness embedded in the discourse of sensibility right now let me come to the form of the poem as it were the poem in which the form in which gray is writing and that is the elegy now all of you will immediately turn around to me and say what are you saying elegy existed from classical poetry she did not come directly to gray no i'm not arguing that now if you look at elegy it comes from the word elege elegos or lament the latin elegos is a poem of lament so we have you know say old english poetry the wife's lament the husband's message even the wanderer is a poem which is written in the elegiac mode but have you ever asked the question why does one write in it we've read elegies elegy is a poem of loss mourning and so on and so forth but what is mourning and what is melancholia i'm of course going back to sigmund freud here but freud in a very important essay makes a distinction between mourning and melancholia the mourning he suggests is 
a temporary phase, right, where a person is trying to cope with a loss of a specific loved object, right? But Freud says this mourning happens within the conscious mind and therefore is an essential process of moving on. Now, we lose somebody, all of us, we mourn him. And very often, part and parcel of this collective mourning is what is the funeral? The funeral is an act of mourning. So in the Hindu funeral, if you've seen, there is the burning, which is the intense phase of mourning. Then comes the shrub or, you know, you pay your homage to your forefathers and see very importantly death as a process of continuity. So you are mourning this entire you know, cycle of life and death and you pay your homage to your departed and then comes, if you remember the Niyom Hongo, as it were, where you once again take the food as a symbol that the period of mourning is over Life must go on and one must move on. You do not forget, but you have to move on with life. So that is what Freud says is the process of mourning. But the if you cannot move on from this grief, right, and that continuously lingers in your mind. So mourning takes place in the conscious mind. Right, you consciously mourn and you consciously move on. But if that sense of loss enters your subconscious mind and takes over your mind, as it were, completely, then you enter into a state of melancholia. You cannot forget the dead. You cannot get over the dead. You the dead become imbued with a kind of a subjectivity and that subjective dead seems to take over your consciousness. So the <coughs> process of melancholia is in the unconscious mind and that takes on a kind of a pathological state. So you cannot come out of it. Therefore, it comes, becomes a kind of a mental disease as it were and that is where it becomes pathological now an elegy is very often like a funeral also so you know when somebody very close is lost you know you lament his presence uh, uh, sorry his or her absence and that lament becomes a way of that writing becomes a kind of a way of moving out of the state. But the reverse may also be true. What if you cannot move out of it? Now that is once again something which is happening in this particular case. It is happening in the sense that Gray and the pre-modern world cannot move out of this passage of life from a particular country existence into this urban commercial modern state. So the poem is, as it were, locked into a melancholic zone where recurrently the reader revisits a particular way of life and, you know, mourns for the passing of or and cannot forget the passing of a particular kind of existence. So, you know, I will argue that, you know, Gray's elegy will be talking about death and how, you know, death is inevitable and so on and so forth. But Gray's elegy is such a powerful text because it moans about a way of living and it sort of cultivates this 
nostalgia, this idea of a particular kind of idyllic rural existence that we periodically revisit because, you know, commercial modernity and the hustle and bustle of life makes us go back to that way of life and try and, you know, sort of think about it. So in a certain sense, this elegy is also locked in a world of melancholia with the power of poetry. Right. So I do have a sort of a write up on this, but I will, I, I have, you know, uh, more or less uh, talked about all this, you know, this is also, there is this idea that, you know, and I'll talk about this when I do uh, Gray's life. Uh, Gray's elegy has also been often seen as his uh, poem in memory of his friend, Richard West. And people have suggested whom who was his fast friend at Eton. And uh, Gray could never really go out of this. You know, one of the, one of the most powerful elegies where, where mourning becomes melancholia and something which you have probably read is Lord Tennyson's, you know, uh, poem in memoriam for Hallam. You know, the, the way in which the, the death of Hallam becomes a kind of a melancholia that visits and revisits uh, Tennyson's poetry forever and forever, really. You know, you go back to his poems and the ways in which Hallam and the sense of loss becomes a perpetual presence. So also in Matthew Arnold's poetry, Dover Beach, where, you know, the sea of fate that was once round us is no more. And that elegy seems to haunt Matthew Arnold's poems over and over again. So in that sense, these are poems which express uh, the state of melancholia. And Grace poetry uh, is also marked by the sense of loss of his friend Richard West. And people have suggested that, critics have suggested that there was uh, there's a kind of a homoerotic uh, feeling for West, which Gray could never really get over from. But more than that, I, I would rather read this poem as a melancholia and a nostalgia for a way of life, which Gray is seeing uh, changing before his very eyes, a way of life which he, can, he realizes, you know, man can never go back to. So there's also a degree of melancholia associated with this, with this. Uh, elegy. Now, the other school of poetry which this has been associated with is, of course, graveyard poetry, right? And graveyard poetry is marked by uh, this particular period between 1740 to 1755. Uh, graveyard poetry is marked by this, you know, obsession, as it were, with death. The major figures, of course, being Thomas Parnell, Robert Blair, the grave is, if you see the dates, Parnell is 1721, Blair is 1743, uh, Edward Young, Night Thoughts, that's 1742, and Elegy written in a country churchyard from Gray, that's 1751, right? So what are the features of this, uh, of this uh, poetry of death, the graveyard school of poems, as it were? So... It is marked by the inevitability of death, the loss of human power in front of death, and the irrelevance of all glory of man. So you have the transient glory of man versus the eternal presence of death and the meaninglessness of this, you know, uh, personal glories. So Gray will be also talking about this in general. That however much you may, you know, cultivate your uh, physical, military, whatever glory you want, ultimately it is within the cycle of time a blip and therefore nothing will matter. Secondly, there is this creation of, a, of an atmosphere, as it were, of anxiety and fear and this light and shade and darkness ever over uh, flowing into these poems. There's also the sense of fear and stoicism. In a certain sense, again, the graveyard school of poetry has also this sense of atmosphere, of twilight. You find that, you know, uh, 
Gray begins this poem with that twilight, the curfew tolls, the knell of parting day, parting day as in ending day, the twilight zone between light and shade, light and darkness. So this creation of this deliberate atmosphere, uh, the sounds, the sights associated with this darkness and the sense of once again uh, a foreboding has very often been linked with as a kind of uh, transition between uh, the between the gothic and the graveyard so you see this is also just the time when the gothic novel is emerging and the gothic is using a particular kind of a a particular kind of a framework of emotions so in a certain sense the graveyard school is also a forerunner of the gothic uh, tradition uh, there is also this concept of the memento mori that man is made for dying that death is the only certitude of life and there's a lament for the people who have died the the kind of things that they could have done and they could not do and how death overwhelmed them all and also you know uh, this very important consideration that you know the, once again the graveyard school ideologically suggests a resistance to this uh, commercial capitalist and individual enterprise which foregrounds you know individual effort the glory of man the uh, continuous you know attempt to gobble up experience wealth a graveyard school of poetry is a resistance in that sense it sees nothing as as eternal everything is transient and meaningless so in a certain sense the graveyard school like the elegy like the uh, literature of sensibility like the gothic is a certain way of distancing oneself from and resisting the uh, discourse of commercial modernity and in and possessive individualism so here is you know the instead of foregrounding man therefore uh, the discourse of the graveyards they foreground death and there are reflections it's a poetry of reflections on the phenomenon of death and its overpowering effect upon man so death himself commands this is young again night thoughts commands the re when men may by scythe and dart supply so this is death speaking the speaking voice is that of death how great a king of fears am i so you know ultimately death is the great king of fears they view me like the last of things they make and then they dread my stings fools if you less provoke your fears no more my but my specter form appears death's but the path that must be trod if a man would ever pass to god a port of calm a state of ease from the rough ridge of the swelling seas so death in in young is seen as a kind of a calm spot before one passes on to the other world and that you know it is that inevitable port we must all visit right so uh, <coughs> Uh, these are then the features of, uh, you know, the graveyard school of poems. Death as the great leveler, as we have seen, death is eternal, wealth is not. So resistance against cultural, uh, uh, against commercial modernity and uh, against consumer society, as it were. So these poems all go back to a kind of a pre-modern way of life where there is the uh, a pastoral setting where there is a, a lack of commercial activity where you know it's bit their subsistence rather than uh, any kind of uh, luxury the common man the common people the village institutions that is the theme of the graveyard poems right so again graveyard poetry also is essentially democratic in the sense that it suggests whoever is rich or young Ultimately, you know, death, the great leveler becomes, uh, makes everybody obscure, right? Now, interestingly, Gray's poem is combining the didactic qualities of graveyard poetry 
and the mournful traits of the elegy. So it suggests that there is death, the great, great leveler. At the same time, the stoicism of the graveyard school is replaced by an intensity of feeling that derives itself from the elegiac tradition. So while it teaches us about death's capacity to level, it also you know, deeply engages with the sense of sorrow and mourning for the people who have passed away. So there is you know, a sense of philosophical acceptance of death. At the same time, there's also a very distinct sense of loss for the people who have encountered it. Right. So uh, I'll give you an example of the graveyard poem. This is The Grave, 1843. Uh, <clears throat> While some affect the sun and some the shade, some flee the city, some the hermitage, their aims, aims as various as the roads they take. In journeying through life, the task be mine to paint the gloomy, gloomy horrors of the tomb, the appointed place of rendered rendezvous where all these travelers meet. So life is seen as a travel where we take our different journeys, but we all meet in that final rendezvous, where, which is the grave. Thy succors I implore, eternal king, whose potent arm sustains the keys of hell and death, the grave eternal dread thing. So you see, even in Young, as well as in Blair, we look at you know death as that eternal king, image of this monarch from whom there's no escape. Ah, how dark the long extended realms and rueful estates, dark as was chaos here, the infant sun, and so on and so forth, cheerless, unsocial plant that loves to dwell. This is again Edward Ping, Edward Young, uh, night thoughts, death, great proprietor of all, it is thine to tread out that empire and to quench the stars. So once again, death is this monarch, the emperor, uh, whose valley we are all continuously weak, walking. Right. So these are the traditions within which then Gray was writing the elegies. And in the last part of my discussion, I'll quickly take a look at Gray's life. Right. Uh, now, I will not linger very much upon this because I've already created the context within which Gray was writing his poems, the traditions of poetry, the themes of his poetry, I just like to take a very quick look at, uh, you know, who was this man, where was he coming from, and what were his major works. So, you see, birth 26 December 1716, Cornhill in London, England, and Gray was, of course, you know, moving around in the earth outskirts of London, also traveling also to Scotland, to the continent. So there was a lot of travel involved in Gray's poetry. He was one of the first poets to actually travel to the, to the Lake District, which Wordsworth would late, later on make the haunt of his poetry. So a poet who traveled within nature, but also had a very, uh, as you can call, intimate knowledge of urban existence. He was a sole survivor of 12 children. Father Philip was a scrivener, somebody who wrote uh, for as a clerk as a profession, and mother was a millinery business businesswoman. The Gray had a very significant classical, very significant education, very high standard of education. So the classical tradition of the poems, his knowledge of the classical tradition of the eclogues, the pastoral, the elegy, which is a classical form, of course comes from his education at Eton College and later on at King's College, Cambridge. Now, in Eton, of course, he became very close friends with Horace Walpole, who was to be one of Gray's major benefactors later on, 1725. Uh, Horace Walpole was, of course, the son of the uh, Prime Minister of England, Robert Walpole. And Horace Walpole was a writer, thinker in his own way. Uh, so, of course, you will remember the writers of one of the greatest Gothic novels, The Castle of Otranto. Uh, 
1734, Gray starts writing. Uh, 1735 is initiated into the inner temple. So he's studying to be a lawyer. Right. He leaves Cambridge in 1738 without taking a degree. Uh, wants to become a lawyer. 1739, very important, goes to the grand tour, goes for the grand tour uh, across the continent, which you know, educated people almost always everybody went. And you know, it is here that at Eton, at Cambridge, and on the grand tour is friends with Richard West, Robert Walpole. So they were very close friends. Uh, by the way, uh, Gray, even in his younger days, was extremely sensitive and not much given to physical activity. So this man of feeling, the image of the sensitive man of sensibility, Gray uh, was, the, was feeling subjectively. So it's his personality that sort of is radiated into the poetry very, from a very early age. Now, 1741, he is in Italy when he quarrels with Walpole, but then later on makes up with him. Right, his father live, uh, dies, and Gray is initiated into a life of poverty. So, suffering poverty was not unfamiliar with him, and therefore, you know, it's the sense of loss, poverty, ordinariness, common uh, life that Gray experienced. So, his sympathy for the common people might have derived from this particular phase. Now, 1743 achieves. Uh, a Bachelor of Laws degree. And uh, by this time, of course, West has died. So 1743, he starts writing uh, these uh, dark, deep poems on death. And parts of the elegy is written during this period. So we will talk about the elegy in greater detail in my next two uh, discussions. So I'm not sort of preempting that discussion. But we'll have to see how the elegy was written in bits and pieces. Right. In 1746, of course, he shows uh, uh, Walpole some of the lines. In 1750, he completes the poem. And, you know, the elegy is very popular. And it, uh, it, is, uh, it is written when he's visiting this area outside London in Lincolnshire called Stoke Poges. And uh, in a short video that I'll make, I'll give you the picture of the actual country churchyard where uh, Gray wrote the uh, elegy. So, you know, this is Stoke Poges, just on the outskirts of London, 1750. He completes it. It becomes very popular. So he has to publish the official version. Uh, 1753, his mother dies. So, you know, this Stoke Poges becomes the graveyard where, you know, Gray himself, his mother, his father are all interred, right? He, 1755, we can see that he's declining to become the secretary of the Earl of uh, Bristol. He moves to Cambridge in 1756, writes his major poems, including the progress of poesy and the bard. Uh, Gray has now become one of the preeminent poets of England. He's offered the poet laureateship but he refuses. And uh, 1759, Gray is sort of staying in London, close to the newly opened British Museum. So you can see Gray's fascination with the objects of the past. 1761, he takes an interest in Nordic and Welsh poetry. So uh, the unfamiliar poetry of the British Isles, uh, Nordish, Welsh, Scottish. So a return to the poetry of the past, as it were tours York and Durham, and then uh, this entire area of the Scottish Highlands in 1756, right? And in 1768, he becomes the Regius Professor of Modern History at Cambridge. And, you know, the Lake District, York and Durham, the uh, hinterlands of England, the rural uh, landscapes, were eternal favorites of Gray, right? So, so two things we must notice here is his, or rather a couple of things. One is his schooling in classical poetry, familiarity with classical forms. Two, his friendship, very close, dense friendship with Walpole and West. West, of course, dies. Uh, 
and becomes an agent of uh, who provokes the writing of the elegy. Now, Gray be then becomes one of the preeminent literary figures of 18th century society, is offered the poet laureateship but declines. And uh, also, you know, this fascination with two things one, nature, rural uh, society, and his fascination with the common men of England who become part and parcel and agents of Gray's poets. Right. 30th July 1771, Gray dies, uh, aged 54, uh, in England uh, at, uh, because of gout. So that then is the, the life of Gay, uh, Gray. Now, of course, you know, uh, Gray was not very well received by Dr. Johnson. He writes the life of Gray and is rather critical about Gray's poetry. He sees Gray's poetry as commonplace very ordinary, but it is the elegy that really has made Gray very famous. Famous is the elegy which lies at the center of his, you know, uh, poetic fame rather than any other poem. So I've created the context for studying the elegy. I've argued that it belongs to a particular phase of English society and is drawn from certain philosophical fluxes, transitions, as well as societal fluxes and transitions. It is a witness to the culture of commercial modernity and an attempt to resist it, however you know, powerful it might be. It tries to look back at a kind of a pre-modern society. It presents the common man as the focus and the protagonist of his poems and also engages with the form of the elegy, the function of the poet in trying to preserve and go back to this particular way of existence. And therefore, the elegy becomes a process of writing and a process of writing that becomes very, very central to this, you know, resistance of the idea of of commercial modernity and individualism and greed that the age was marked by. We've seen a life of Gray and the major signposts of his life. We've talked about the graveyard school of poetry and its features, and we've read some of the lines of these graveyard poems. Now, it is with this entire corpus of fact and reading at the back of our mind, then, that it is probably time that we uh, went into the details of the essay, of the elegy proper. We've already seen that, you know, by 1746, it's almost complete, although it's published officially in 1751. So we will take a look at the composition of the elegy and we'll study the first, say, 50, 60 odd lines of the poem in our next discussion. And in our third discussion, we will, of course, read the remaining parts of the text and discuss the major critical issues. So thank you for, you know, uh, having been my companion in this journey through Gray's text, uh, through Gray's context, rather, not the text. And I hope that you will be a, a companion in my journey through Gray's text, which I'll take up uh, tomorrow once again at 10.30 a.m. So uh, thank you for being here today and uh, hope to see you tomorrow once again. Have a very good day, ladies and gentlemen, and stay safe during this entire period of the pandemic.